Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, please make sure to turn on your um, translation, which is a little globe at the end of your screen, which says interpretation, because we have interpretation from English to Spanish language and the other way around. Um, hello, good morning, good day, good evening, depends on where you're coming from. Thank you for joining us at our online discussion series called Power of Feminist Narratives. I'm Nada Kuchukalic, and I'm welcoming you on behalf of Global Unit for Feminism and Gender Democracy of the Hendrikar Foundation and our office director, Jana Flesinger, as well as my two colleagues, Joanna and Adna, who made this series possible. Today, it is my privilege uh, to be speaking here at the time when the world is facing immense challenges. Uh, the wars happening in different places of the world, economic crisis worldwide, and just recent natural disasters that we are witnessing. On top of it all, the rise of restrictive policies is affecting us all, especially the most vulnerable ones. In this online series, we will discuss the always challenging topic of feminist narratives and explore how these narratives have shaped and continue to shape our society, such as the feminist approach to intersectionality, inclusivity, teaching, researching, and writing towards achieving gender democracy. We still haven't found a better system than democracy, yet we do may feel that democracy has failed us sometimes. Feminism has always been a driving force for equality, and it is more uh, than just equal rights for women. It is about creating a world in which everyone is free to live, love, and be who they are. Today and in the next few weeks, we will together explore the ways of building feminist solidarities and the narratives that drive this movement. As feminists, we believe it is our responsibility to work together despite our differences. We all say we want peace, stability, dignity, love, and acceptance. But sometimes it's as if we speak different language and don't understand each other. Do we actually hear each other or we just listen? This is why dialogue is not a matter of a choice, it's a must. We in Heinrichville Foundation, Global Unit for Feminism and Gender Democracy, passionately believe and advocate that only united we build more equal opportunities for all. Having in mind that more equal rights for still marginalized ones do not exclude the rights of others. We can look at this current anti-feminist, anti-gender movement rising, mm -hmm. not as a threat, but as our opportunity to unite. During the next five weeks, um, starting from today and then every Tuesday until March 7, we will listen and learn from 10 panelists coming from nine different countries, from India to Colombia, from Poland to South Africa. They are activists, academics, writers, teachers, parents, partners, and they are people who contribute to our society in different ways. I hope we will all learn and gain from these panels, either professionally or personally. Now I'm happy to introduce you to our moderator and facilitator, Wandita Morarka who will be taking us through the process during the five online panels. Vandita is the founder and CEO of One Future Collective from India, but also a human rights lawyer, social justice leader, organizer, and feminist researcher. Vandita, we're happy to have you and your team with us. Um, thank you for being with us and joining us, and I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Naida, uh, especially for the kind introduction. Uh, working with your team has been such a joy, and I'm so excited to be able to bring this to all our participants today. It's a really a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. I hope that this is a space for learning and community for each of us. So to get us started, I'm excited to welcome our panelists for today. Um, yes, um, Julia Ert, they're joining us from ILGA. They're a transgender activist and executive director at ILGA World, the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans, and Intersex Association. Thank you. Um, we also have with us Lee Coeller. 
They're the executive director of the feminist organization Sentido from Colombia. I know that with both of them, we'll be having an amazing conversation and there will be lots of, lots, uh, of learnings today. Before we kickstart the panel, there's a question for participants from me, while I also share some housekeeping ground rules. The question is, what color has your day been like so far? You can use the chat to share what you're feeling like. I'm going to kickstart us with saying my day has felt like pink. Lovely. I'm seeing a lot of pinks and peaches and yellows. So while that comes in, I wanted to take a moment to share some housekeeping information. I request that you rename yourself with your name and your pronouns as you feel comfortable. Um, it would be easier for us to refer to you later when we do the Q&A. We have 30 minutes towards the end for questions and answers from the participants. You can share your questions as they come up for you in chat and we will refer to them at the end and pick some of them for our Q&A session. As Naida has already mentioned, there is an interpretation option that you can access by clicking the globe at the bottom of your screen. And of course, last, um, as in every feminist space and otherwise, um, I request you to be respectful of each other, both while using the chat and asking questions. And I hope that we can hold space for differences and hold each other with comfort and joy through the next hour and a half as we engage in this conversation. Lovely. I see a lot of colors still coming in. Thank you for sharing those with us. Um, I'm going to kick start with a question to both of you, um, Julia and Lee, and feel free to share some opening reflections as well while you answer. I think the first question from our side is, what do you think is needed to build alliances between cisgender and transgender activists? And it'll be really useful if you can share a little bit about the history of the split of TERFs from other feminists and when that happened and how. Um, so perhaps, Julia, you want to go first and then Lee. All right. Thanks a lot, Vandita. And thanks a lot uh, for the invitation to speak here today. I am very excited and look very much forward to the next two hours um, of conversation and discussion. Um, and yes, thanks for the question. I'll start with the second one about the history of, um, you know, the split of TERF and other feminists. When did that happen? Um, and then come to the... Um, what is needed to build alliances, which I think is a little bit more straightforward, to be honest. So um, for the second question, to be honest, I don't think that there has been a split between the, you know, between a trans inclusive women's movement and a trans exclusive women's movement. Um, and if you look into the history, I even would go as far as say that maybe 30 years ago, the question that didn't even exist um, because both in the women's, the feminist, but as well in the LGBT movement, trans people were generically excluded or were not at the table at all. Um, so the fact that there is now a, um, a large part of the women's movement, I would argue, that is trans inclusive is like a new phenomenon. So um, I would argue that the, the split has happened, that there, there is a split and, there is, and I think there is a crucial fault line within women's movements between those who are trans inclusive and those who are being, um, who are trans exclusive. Um, but that fault line or split has developed over time by the fact that a growing part of the women's movement became trans inclusive. And I think when you look at the movement um, that the LGBTI movement that ILGA World, my, the organization I work for uh, serves, I think there's been a very similar pattern. There, there's some differences because I think trans people have been historically at the beginning of the movements, like very strongly at the table. Like if you look in Germany, for example, and Berlin of the 20s, I think there was not, not such a divide between gay and trans activists at the time. And as well in the 60s and 70s, Stonewall, etc. I think trans, in particular women, were at the forefront of these movements. But then over time, trans people have been um, excluded in the, in, in the LGBT movement. And now we're coming back to the table, I think. That's, an, that's kind of an, an effect of the last 10 years. And I think the women's movement here is similar. Um, second, what I wanted to mention here is that very often the it's not that clear cut whether an organization, a person or a group is like trans inclusive or trans exclusive. I think there's like there's like a bandwidth of tr both trans inclusivity and trans exclusivity. And the term TERV, as it's very often used, is well, A, very often perceived as a slur and as well, very often used as a slur and not always helpful because um, I think 
looking for looking forward what is needed um is you know to build bridges and alliances and to call people in and not so much to call people out for being exclusive um and therefore i think from a movement point of view that that divide or that split between um a part of the movement is exclusive of trans women in particular or trans people and it's inclusive that um split or fault line actually weakens the whole movement as such and i think it's pivotal for all of us in the feminist movement to try to build bridges and close that fault line or address that fault line and gap so how do you do that um and that brings me to the first question how do you build alliances um, between cisgender and transgender um, activists and I think there's like three key ingredients that are needed in any alliance and that is trust mutual understanding as well as a joint or a shared goal or goals so trust mutual understanding and shared goals and I think maybe the last one shared goals um I would argue this is almost obvious but it's it's kind of worth stating the obvious here too and that um does not only affect trans women or trans people and women i think it it's safe to state that the struggle for lgbti equality and feminist struggles are in essence the same so why because both of these or all of these struggles root in gendered expectations towards the individual whether that is in regard to the role that a certain person has in society whether it's whether it's an expectation towards how they behave in their sex life or how they identify it comes down to gendered expectations of the society towards an individual um, and that's kind of and making this equitable gender just um for everyone livable um in dignity that's kind of the core root of all our movements and i think it's important to emphasize that in order to build exactly these bridges and 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 um and that as well will foster you know mutual understanding which is the second component of bridge building and um alliance building and then of course trust has to be built over time you know to have well meetings like this to have shared and common projects and to build a spaces where we can listen to each other and then build from that in order to do the common work um yeah and maybe I'll I'll leave it here and um hand over to Lee Thank you so much, Julia. I'm very, very happy to be here. And I want to thank uh, Heinrich Boll and uh, mainly Joanna and Jana, who uh, in 2021 invited us to work with you. So um, I'm going to just speak in Spanish for a few seconds uh, to say thank you for the Spanish, uh, Spanish speaking people here. So if you want to turn on the translation, um, uh, Hola a todas las personas que hablan español de España y América Latina. Estoy súper contenta de estar acá y quiero darle las gracias por unirse a este evento. También quiero darle las gracias a Silvia, quien nos está haciendo la interpretación de español a inglés. Voy a volver a inglés, eh, pero muchas gracias por unirse. So, um, here in English again. <laughs> So I am Lee Cuellar, I am the director of Sentido. I identify myself as a non-binary person. Uh, and I am very happy also to be sharing this space with, with Julia, a person who I admire a lot. So thank you, Julia, for your, for your super complete answer. I think I don't have like much to add about the history of, of, of the supposedly uh, split between trans exclusionary exclusionary radical feminists and the rest of the feminism but i want to highlight also something that i find quite interesting and is how trans exclusionary radical feminists are uh, making alliances with conservative groups and i think that this is new and this has to call our attention on how you know feminism this this so-called feminism of this group is playing against feminism in general because you know feminism has been working very very hard to question to uh, review you know social policies against women but also against people and these groups by making these alliances with uh, new you know right-wing groups and conservative groups are uh, harming the movement and i think that we should you know mention that and talk about it more 
because in the case of Spain, for example, you know that uh, they, they make, made these alliances with Vox to stop the gender identity laws. And in the case of Colombia, for example, there is a, you know, a, a, a bill, a project about uh, 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 trans, uh, gains transitions for trans people and, you know, this gender uh, uh, critical, uh, I don't like the name, but, you know, a trans exclusionary uh, people are, you know, starting talking with uh, right wing uh, groups and movements and parties to, uh, you know, strengthening these this, uh, this, this policies and projects. So I think that that's important and that's new. And I think it's like, you know, I'm surprising to see that a feminist can do such a big alliance to stop the recognition of trans and non-binary people. That's for the, for the first uh, um, question. And the second, um, well, I think that it's very important. Sentido is an, uh, an LGBTIQ organization that is also feminist. And uh, we, uh, we, have, uh, we have been very insistent in the fact that we have to read the context, but, all, but mainly listen to trans and non-binary voices in the region. You know, in the case, I, I will talk about this later, but in the case of the trans feminisms in Latin America, uh, uh, there's a link that uh, 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 we will share in the chat that you can find the, the research and the mapping we did. And there's an, it, it is in English, in Spanish, and Portuguese. So we, 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 we can't talk about trans feminisms or feminism in general, if we don't listen to what trans and non-binary people have to say about feminisms. So um, it, it is also very important because we, you know, I, in, in last years, I mean, since 2021, I identified myself as a lesbian. So I was talking about feminism without, you know, understanding what was, feminism for trans and non-binary people. And I think this research that was uh, made with the help uh, and support of, of Heinrich Ball showed us that we, there are a lot of ideas about what trans feminism is in Latin America and how trans and um, travesty, travesty, travesty is a, you know, a Latin American concept that we need to leverage also, are talking about feminism and saying, hey, <laughs> Cisgender feminists should, you know, you should pay attention to what is going on here in Latin America. So um, we did this mapping, uh, and we are also reaching out these trans leaders and non-binary leaders, and establishing communications and professional relationships with them. So we don't, as Julia mentioned, we don't, you know, work separately. I think what it. This is one of the most important things we should do. And as Sentido also does uh, journalism, we are leveraging their voices and experiences uh, to work as a multiplier. Right. Thank you, Leah and Julia. I think they were such interesting and important points. I do want to highlight, um, Julia, do you want to come in with something? Yeah, I was wondering whether it was, was okay to add something because uh, when Lee spoke, I, I realized I wanted to respond to one thing because it's far from, you know, obvious that Sen Sentido or LGBTI organizations for uh, for that matter are feminist. I mean, our movement um, has been strongly dominated uh, by, you know, pretty much gay organizations. ILGA World, um, my organization, used to be the International Gay Association many, many decades ago. Um, so it's not obvious that lgbti organizations are, are feminist the contrary it's like it's a very re it's i would say it's a rather recent phenomenon and it, it is hard work in that has to happen in the lgbti movement in order you know to become more feminist in order to um um be able that the whole movement uh, builds bridges with the feminist movement and it's not only the lesbian or the trans organizations but that we as a whole movement understand that we fight the same struggle. What I said in the beginning, it's not that, you know, the LGBTI movement as such understands this across the board. That's it's like as well internally, very, very hard work. And ILGA World only last year has added to our constitution that we work through a, femi through a feminist and intersexual lens. So 
working with an intersectional approach is not obvious either in the LGBTI movement. So there's, and what I'm saying is it's not only that um, the women's movement has had to have a, or has to have a learning curve when it comes to trans and LGBTI issues. It's the same within our movement. Um, and as well, it's, it's really, really hard work um, to, you know, overcome uh, those non-feminist barriers that we face. Um, in fact, uh, Lee, when you shared that something that stood out for me, where you said Sentido is LGBTQI organization and also feminist, uh, because it made me realize how intentionally you're thinking about your work and not just who you work with, but the approach you take. And I think that is so important and really contributes to how we must be doing this movement building work as well. And from what both of you shared, I think something that really has stayed with me is the idea of collective liberation and how none of us, you know, will be free till all of us are and why this needs to be an integrated movement. So thank you for that. I'm going to now ask the participants a question. You will see a quick poll come up on your screen. And it's actually a question shared by Lee. Um, is do you know about gender critical movements? So you can take a minute and you can quickly vote and then we'll move ahead with other questions. I love it. We already have like 65 votes. So we'll give it a few more seconds. Right, lovely. Um, Olivia, perhaps we can end the poll. Yes, thank you. So about 77% of you participated and about 58% of you know about it, 19% um, don't and 23% say can't say. Um, I think building off that, I think the next question is quite important and it's directed at Lee. Um, the larger question, Lee, is that why do you think trans feminism is important in the fight for human rights and in feminism in general? But I would also love to hear from you about what guided your organization to take up the project you were mentioning and the approach you've taken, right? Investing money into researching those doing good versus researching gender critical movements. So I think we'd all love to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you so much, Pandita. And thank you for uh, answering the poll. I, I think that, that's, a, that's very important that we, sh we don't assume that all people are speaking the same language and understand everything that we are mentioning. So I'm just wanna, wanna just share a few definitions about trans feminisms uh, that we also have it in our research. So trans feminisms are a strand of feminism that centers the, vo the voices, experiences, practices, and knowledge of trans and travesti women. Remember, I use travesti as a Latin American word, which is very political. Uh, it's not transvestite, it's just tra travesti that was used as a slur in the past. Um, and travesty women as, a key ele as key elements in the liberation of all women and as necessary for an equitable distribution of rights, opportunities, and resources among all people. To this end, trans feminisms consider other categories of oppression like racialization and class. Trans feminisms understand that sexism and transphobia are interconnected and that the liberation of trans people, in particular trans and travesty women, is intrinsically linked to the liberation of all women. The term transfeminism is used to denote a series of feminist principles and practices developed principally, uh, though not exclusively, by trans and travesty women who use an intersectional lens to question gender essentialism, transphobia with, within feminism, and the precariousness of migrant, racialized, impoverished, and gendered non-conforming bodies. Some believe that trans feminisms are movements by and uh, for travesty and trans women. This is, a, uh, this is an idea of the leader, uh, Leah Rivas. Others believe that trans feminism should center trans and travesty women, but that trans men can and should be included. And alliances with cisgender people should also be made. This is an idea of Jacqueline Gomez, uh, Jesus, Leticia Nascimento, and Joanna Maturana. Finally, 
there are some who consider trans feminisms in a wider sense, breaking with Western subjectivities to become a movement of the masses. Such, move, such a movement includes, but is not limited to multiple subjects in transit, with migrants uh, among others. Also, I think that trans feminism is in a position that we are, we've been working also with Heinrich Ball about decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing uh, uh, you know, movements, uh, in this case, in Latin America and in, in Colombia. How these organizations that fund our projects have also a responsibility of decolonizing their practices and, and the way they fund projects. Now, this is a discussion we have had with Joanna, Diana, Marima, etc. So um, for this question also, I think that, uh, you know, uh, trans feminism is important, of course, as we have mentioned, because it is trans feminisms are showing us that feminism is not just what we read in the theories, you know, but it's also what we see in the practices. And there are a lot of trans organizations that uh, don't work with theories, with academia, and I want to uh, include the question of Yulia about, you know, this split between academia and activism. And I think that trans organizations and trans feminist leaders, leaders are showing us that theory can be done outside academia, academia and also that trans feminist movements and organizations and leadership are showing us that feminism uh, is not is not like a perfect you know body that we are we, we where we can go and take theories and experiences, but also that we have decolonized that we have have to think about migration in the case of Colombia, for example, Colombia has uh, fifty million uh, in, uh, people, and there there are uh, five million people from Venezuela right now. so uh, how migration, how trans Venezuelan women are living their experience as migrant people in Colombia, for example. I don't know. There's a lot of migration in the world, so we, you, I know you, you will have a lot of examples. Um, and uh, to, to respond to that, the second question of Pandita. Um, yes, so I, I don't have more time, Pandita, for the second question. No, please take a minute. Okay, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, it's just so exciting to talk about this. Uh, so what we decided with Heinrich Ball for this project that started in 2021st was that uh, we didn't want to invest the money uh, the, the funders give us to, to do research on people who are harming, you know, to, uh, to, to research, to do research on, uh, gender uh, uh, um, so, um, trans exclusionary movements. But we wanted to invest the money on trans leaders, trans organizations. We wanted to, have to, to, to put our platform to leverage these voices and to change the narratives because we work in uh, narratives for social change. So we want to do inspiring stories. We want to help these voices to be, you know, to have more impact. We want to 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 put the, the, the discussion in the region, you know, Central America, South America, about how trans feminisms are are being built. So uh, I think that's a good experience, and later on I will show some just a few examples of that. So uh, of course it's import, important to uh, check and to see what uh, organizations are doing against human rights. But we have to stop doing it at, at a certain point and, and start saying, okay, what are we doing? What are trans organizations doing? And how can we help trans organizations to be to have more impact and presence in the region and in the debate? Thank you, Lee. That was really powerful. Um, I think something that really stood out for me was how your answer focused my thoughts back onto the fact that feminist work is not just about dismantling oppression or structures of oppression, but it's also about building alternatives. And that building of alternatives requires that we direct our resources and where resources and money go is very political. And it's often a trade-off, right? So what, it, like, what does it come at the expense of? Thank you for sharing that in your work. For participants, their work is also shared in chat. So do check it out. Um, the links are shared earlier on. 
I also want to remind participants that you can share a bunch of questions with us in chat. We're looking out for them and we will get to them at the end of the webinar as well. Okay, lovely. Um, I do want to ask both of you a question now and bringing back to the theme of our webinar, which is around storytelling. I think it's really important for us to understand for both of you and for your organizations, whom do you want to reach with your storytelling? And what kind of media do you use for this? What stories lead to more engagement? And why do you think this happens? I know, Julia, in our conversations, you mentioned you'd also want to share why you're making the shift. So maybe we start with you and then we go to Lee. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot, Vandita. And yeah, thanks a lot for the for the question. And in fact, um, historically, um, Ilga World has not done too much uh, storytelling in the first place. Um, and I think that's probably true for LGBTI movements in general, because if you look at the, let's say, the last 20 or maybe even 40 years of our movement, the LGBTI movement, as, as well as the trans movement as such, has been extremely successful uh, by achieving legal change through a human rights discourse. So using a rights-based approach to change laws and policies in, well, countries and societies. So now, and that has been incredibly successful. I mean, if you look at the history, we went from, from being severely criminalized in a lot of countries to, in some countries, to marriage equality um, or to uh, legal general recognition based on self-determination. Um, and that's kind of a drastic change. However, all is legal. Um, and the reason why we are we are in, in a in a time where we are shifting from a legal discourse to a storytelling discourse is because very often we observe that the using a rights frame or human rights frame does not reach the hearts and minds of people. I mean, it's it's a very strong frame because it's a very it can be a very strong frame in a legal discourse, but if you want to change perceptions in societies to reach the hearts and minds, it's not a useful tool. But storytelling is telling the story either of an individual or of a group reaches the hearts and minds, um, or, or has the potential to reach hearts and minds of of people, which um, is required if you want to, you know. Um, come to true equality in societies because I mean the legal framework or the rights framework is one but I mean what we actually want to achieve is like true equality um, for um, women, trans women, trans people, LGBTI people in our societies and for that the a, a rights frame is kind of a not well not a dead end but it's not sufficient in order to achieve that so and therefore we are moving towards telling personal stories and in particular when we when we look at or when we analyze the discourses that are emerging around trans exclusion like what are the frames that are used in order to make the case that trans women are not women for example that they should be treated that trans women or trans people should be dif treated differently than other women it's very often well one not factual but very often as well very emotional arguments um, that, you know, reach um, kind of an emotional core of people that speaks to, you know, to, to, an, to an emotional being and not so much to a rational being. I mean, and if, if we keep narrating, um, or if we, if we figure, if we keep narrating um, a legal discourse, we will lose all these people that are spoken to in an emotional way. So what I think we are starting to do is developing exactly those stories that count on, that kind of speak um, to an emotion, like to an emotional, have an emotional dimension. And for that, storytelling is exactly the right frame. This will be a, and this is a, around um, how certain persons, trans people, LGBTI people are, you know, treated what are their experiences in society and what are their struggles in order to reach what we would call the movable middle, like the persons who can be swayed in one in one way or the other, depending to whom they listen to. Um, so for us, I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a new field, I have to say. Um, and, <laughs> um, and of course, as an organization, we are working globally. So, and we, I think from a global point of view, we're like a small organization. So our ability to actually reach large constituencies um, in societies is like, let's say limited. Um, but still, we believe we're going to lose a legal, like a legal, we lose a battle if we continue using a legal frame. And that's why we're moving towards um, speaking, uh, using story storytelling as a means to reach 
um, the hearts and minds of people. Thank you, Julia. I love that. Um, Lee, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you, Julia, for your answer. Actually, I <clears throat> completely agree with what you have said. Uh, and and um, I just want to recommend a book, which is very interesting. And actually, it mentions, it talks about the movable middle and, you know, how to change the framing, which is uh, Don't Think of an Elephant, a <clears throat> book by George Lakoff or Lakoff. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, it's a very interesting book about you know how it, he he bases his theory on how Trump did his campaign for for the you know, presidential elections, but I think this book changes uh, changes our, our point of view of how how to frame the discussion and is what Julia was mentioning. Uh, actually, at the beginning, we were you know we were doing like uh, a usual we're using a usual strategy about using a myth, you know state using the myth and then giving the real information. And, you know, the new storytelling uh, methodology says that whenever we use a myth, uh, uh, we are reinforcing it. So we should stop doing that because whenever we say, you know, uh, uh, homosexuals don't rape kids, we are saying that and people will say, oh, homosexuals rape kids because we are, you know, reinforcing it. So, you know, the storytelling and this kind of narratives what, what makes like, you know, force us to change the way we talk about our own identities. It's not, not, not from the myth, not from the, the you know, the wrong side of, uh, of the, that version, but the positive one, as Julia was saying. So when, to answer the, Vanita, your question, uh, uh, our main goal with our, our stories is to reach LGBTIQ feminists and people who care about human rights. And I think also we stopped saying that we wanted to get out of the bubble because we were not talking to the rest of the people because we noticed also that LGBTIQ people and feminists need a lot of resources and information because you know being LGBTIQ or identifying as an LGBTIQ person doesn't make you a person who knows about it, who knows about human rights. So we, we want to give uh, information, resources, and uh, ways to start discussions on LGBTIQ and uh, uh, feminism in, in, you know, with your friends, your pals, your, your workmates, uh, etc. But also, as Julia was, was mentioning before, uh, we are promoting, and also I think we are pushing a little bit, <laughs> uh, like that leaders, uh, mainly feminists, you know, uh, what, what we call in Spanish, like old feminists, to speak out loud about their position on uh, trans people. So we are promoting that cisgender activists, uh, activists and organizations become more vocal about their thoughts and positions on trans rights. Because uh, a lot of people think that trans exclusionary practices and speeches are a responsibility of the trans movement. And that is not correct, you know? Uh, these attitudes leave again trans and non-binary people alone with their struggle for recognition, equality, and respect. So we are really working hard, you know, to, you know, eh, I don't know how to say that in English, but, you know, push a little bit people to say, okay, so we, we, we now want to hear about your ideas on trans rights, and, you know, uh, uh, be more vocal, because uh, otherwise the discussion we will be again uh, on, trans people and their, you know, like if that was their responsibility. Thank you so much, um, Julia and Lee. I think I really love that point. And it's something that I struggle with because I'm a human rights lawyer. And when I was younger, I thought everything changes in a courtroom, right? And then I saw that things change in the courtroom, but what Julia said, nothing's changed with the people that I live with, with my family, with my friends. And on a day-to-day -day basis, that emotional acceptance of my community is as important for me as the social protections that law provides. And I think that's such an integral point. And to me as a cure person in my journey, that's been so important. And I think Lee, especially what you shared about the power of personal stories to activate this feeling that this isn't the problem of only one person or one group. This is something that we're all collectively responsible for. And it only changes when we all come together. I think they're really um, very, very insightful points. Thank you so much. 
Um, I also want to point out that we have some excellent questions coming in in chat um, and we are noting them. We will get to them at the end of the webinar today. Right, so um, another question for both of you. Um, perhaps this time um, I can start with Julia and look at, I would want to understand how have trans-inclusive narratives opened doors for you in terms of being a membership organization? And perhaps, Lee, um, when we come to you, it'll be great to understand from you, especially in the context of the work you do, how has it opened up doors for you in the region of Latin America? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. I think um, when we look at the LGBTI movement in, in general, I think being moving towards being more trans inclusive has as well helped the whole movement to be more inclusive in the first place to you know not only be trans inclusive but to increasingly work through an intersectional frame uh, which of course helps with trans inclusivity but as well helps with other um power dy uh, power dynamics that the lgbti movement as many other movements have have been not sufficiently challenged or replicated like around race for example around being ignorant around colonial legacy um so in that sense i think the trajectory of the LGBTI movement, and I think it's quite similar to the to the women's movement, to be honest. The, the trajectory has been to become more aware of the internal exclusions and the replication of social patterns that we, that many of us, you know, grow up with and then replicate within our own movement, which actually counters or is in opposition to the values that our movements hold in the first place. Um, and I think in that sense, becoming aware of those internal power struggles um, has helped the whole movement, has helped all of us to be more true to our cause, um, to be able to better you know, walk the talk of actual equality. Because I mean, of course you can't claim or you can argue or it, it weakens your own cause, to put it like that, it weakens your own cause um, for if you argue for your own equality, but at the same time exclude um, parts of your own movement. And I think that has, you know, opened up, be, becoming aware of that has opened up um, kind of a whole um, array of possibilities as well to work across movements, work with other movements. Um, and of course, we all know if we all stand together, we are like more, we are like stronger together than, than if we walk, you know, alone. And, you know, I mean, many people have said that uh, as well in the feminist movement, of course, there's like no single issue struggle. I mean, at the end of the day, equality, and I think you have, you've said it in the, in the beginning, Vandita, um, there is no, you know, we're only free, we're, we will only be free once every one of us are free. And I think that's a learning that we could take from being more trans or otherwise inclusive in our movements. Thank you, Julia. Um, Lee, I'd love to hear from you as well. Thank you. So I think that, well, as um, Julia mentioned before, uh, we are also prioritizing the, um, uh, uh, what would the Ameri what the American activist Loretta Ross calls calling him. So this means building relationships instead of shaming people who make harmful, harmful comments. We invite people to dialogue and make an effort to understand different perspectives of what uh, they are making reference to. So we also believe in promote, uh, believe in promote and practice narratives for social change. So it's not just a matter of telling one person's story. It's a matter of making this story available for others to understand uh, bigger issues and challenges as transphobia, sexism, inequality, uh, migration, among others. And uh, I think that our experience, what the doors that it has opened to us is that, first of all, it has helped us to question our own practices, uh, our own practices as an LGBTQ organization. For example, uh, for this project, and uh, I, I remember we have this discussion with Joanna and Jana, we, uh, we, we uh, didn't have a, a trans person, a trans researcher in our organization. And we had this discussion of, uh, in, in, we already started the project and we had this discussion of, oh my God, we don't have a trans person here. So we are, we are you know, replicating a lot of back, bad practices and tokenization, of course. So 
that was very helpful for us to, you know, start, you know, op opening uh, more uh, uh, opportunities for trans people to work in, 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 in Sentido. And also, uh, and I want to acknowledge Danielle, who is uh, uh, the, first trans, the, the first researcher we had, and also Alanis, who is not here, but she should be here speaking. Uh, uh, and she also pr uh, was part of this research. Also, I think that uh, other uh, uh, oh, doors that this research has opened uh, to us is to build more bridges between LGBTIQ feminist and trans feminist organizations and leaderships, and you know, helping build a network for the region. Because I think uh, Latin America has a very, very strong uh, and a very powerful, uh, has very powerful stories, experiences that can be a model for the rest of the world. You know, we are a huge continent. We all speak, or mainly, not all, but we uh, most speak Spanish. And of course, we have to start uh, 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 building more bridges with Brazil. This is why we are including our uh, Portuguese translations of our reports also, so we can build more bridges between a huge country. Is most, is, I think, is like the half of the continent is Brazil. So uh, we should, you know, start talking more with, with, with Brazil, which is also a country that is living a, a very um, difficult situation with uh, human rights, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, Bolsonaro and this litigation. Uh, and I think that the um, last door that it has opened up to us is that we can uh, keep going with uh, our creativity, you know, doing things differently, you know, uh, um, um, enjoying what we do and telling people this is a uh, this is a uh, 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 a thing a thing that we can enjoy. We can have fun, as Lorella Ross says. We can have fun by doing this. It's not only a matter of you know, like being super serious and being super serious with our founders and with an all like yeah. But we also but saying like this can be a a very interesting and happy time. To do a lot of things and to put our discourses, speeches, and experiences in the debate and telling people we, we should have fun with this also. Thank you. Thank you for also concluding on that note of having a little fun while we do this. Um, it reminds me of this quote which says, what's the point of a revolution if you can't dance? And both of you have been giving me that energy today. So thank you for that. Um, before we move ahead to the next question, I think something that I reflect on from both of you is that stories have been very integral to spreading the message and also to opening doors and just getting more people engaged in the work that you do. So perhaps we can also ask our participants now, uh, we'll maybe launch a quick poll now to understand if stories have ever helped you change your mind about social issues. So this is about you, not the work you do. Has it ever changed your mind? Also for Julian Lee, this is like good insight to um, incorporate into your next programming. Oh, lovely. We have about 60 responses, maybe a few more seconds. Olivia, do we want to close the poll? Thank you. Um, that's an astounding number because there's no one that says no, right? 87% people say yes. Um, and a bunch of people say, can't say, we don't know uh, fully. But it's a big number to say that we are influenced by stories. And stories guide a lot of how we see the world and how we want to shape the world. Yes, so thank you for that. Um, I think people are able to see my screen and the results here. Yeah? Thank you. Lovely. Um, so, Julia, now my next question is for you, um, especially in keeping with what you shared, right, about the rights-based approach you have taken and the shift to storytelling that you hope to make, too, is how do you manage to multiply your approaches, which is to win allies, reach more people, and also to keep promoting these trans-inclusive narratives? Yeah, uh, maybe first, we, 
Well, both we ILGA world, but I think there's a general pattern in the LGBTI movement, as well as in trans movements, uh, for that matter. Um, we've been deliberately building bridges to Eastern women's movement organizations, as well global ones, but as well regional um, and national ones. Um, and I think um, that, of course, well, that of course has has helped us um, to reach large audiences, um, and as well has well ha has helped you know the our um, feminist counterparts to you know reach LGBTI um, movements to an end, um, and. In the last years, we've been very deliberate in finding ways how to cooperate with feminist organizations, but as well with uh, sexual reproductive health and rights organizations across the board. Um, because again, um, we're at the end of the day, the core argument is that we're all fighting the same struggle. And I mean, we need to find ways in order to, to fight those struggles together in order to multiply all our voices um, in order to reach constituencies. Because as I've said um, earlier, I mean, from a global perspective, ILGA World is a small organization. I mean, LGBTI world, we are of course big, but I think from a global perspective, we are relatively small. And our ability to reach the hearts and minds of people, like of a large constituency is relatively limited. Um, and hence, working with other feminist um, and women's organization, organizations deliberately um and has helped us reach um much larger constituencies and another item that i wanted to um respond to it's i think it's something that lee had said um alluded to earlier a little bit um in regard to how um anti-gender or anti-trans narratives can to conservative and sometimes right-wing narratives um and I think that is something that I wanted to mention here as well is we are acutely aware that or that um, narratives that are anti-trans or anti-gender or LGBTI critical are not always about trans, are not always about gender or LGBTI. They are very often as well a strategy in order to harness political um, capital on the conservative among conservative political actors or right-wing political actors. Um, and in that way, they're only on the surface about trans people or trans people or against, you know, um, LGBTI um, issues, but in their core, they're used in order to harness political capital. Like, for example, when there were the national elections in Hungary, at the same time, there's a, there's, there's a, um, a poll being being conducted among the Hungarian population around um, LGBTI issues. I mean, this this was very likely in order to get conservative voting voters to the voting block to the voting ballot, and not so much about LGBTI rights. And I think we have to, it is important to understand that because if we continue to only push back on you know um, on gender and LGBTI issues and fail to fail to see that there's a broader picture that is around the rule of law and and, and democracy we'll we will continue to lose ground um and i think that again that analysis again opens up to um cooperating with again a, a whole new set of actors which which evolve around strengthening democracy and the rule of law which are let, let's say non-traditional allies to lgbti or feminist issues i would say but i think it's in, it's important because i mean both our like those actors and us will both lose if we fail to work on those matters thank you julia that's really powerful and it really speaks to the fact that queerness is not just about identity but it's a much larger like political orientation and a lens through which we must see the world. And when we do that, we have to think about allies that we build beyond just say, you know, they're cure, so we work with them, but to think about where our ideologies and intentions align. Thank you for bringing that up. In fact, earlier, I think both of you also spoke to the material and class analysis of the cure struggle that is very important and to think of the material outcomes of these struggles as well. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move into another um, audience poll. In keeping with what Julia asked as well, the question for you is, do you believe that inter-movement solidarity is necessary for shifting power? So you'll have about 30 seconds to respond.
We'll give it another few seconds. Olivia, I think we can close the poll now. Thank you. So there's a 97% of you that say inter-movement solidarity is necessary. I will say that all of you showing up here um, is an indicator of that. And I hope that after this conversation, this carries forward for you as well. Right, lovely. Thank you. Um, I want to move this question to both of you. Um, something that's come up in what you've shared earlier is also the issue of language, right? And multiple other barriers that contribute to building these alliances, especially when you're thinking of narratives and the politics around language. So my question would be, what is content that you think is that relevant and impactful? that it becomes important to translate it into other languages, to be able to spread it globally. I think, Julia, in your context, it would be overall useful to hear, but also very specifically, as a membership organization, what does this mean for you, considering the historical language barriers to cure inclusion, right? And Lee, um, considering your work in building these solidarities in Latin America, you mentioned that you know, your work is translated into Portuguese, and that effort is happening. So how do you make these decisions? And how do you think this can be replicated in other parts of the world? Um, Lee, perhaps we start with you and come to Julia. Thank you, Vandita. I, I want to point out just uh, something that you were discussing in the last question, and is that, for example, in the case of uh, 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 alliances with other organizations or more intersectional uh, uh, conversations, uh, since 2017, we've been working with religion uh, and you know building bridges between religions and gender and sexual diversity and the, our experience shows us that there are a lot of uh, faith communities leader religious leaders that want that are working with lgbtiq people that are that they don't feel included in the lgbtiq movement because people are super critical about practicing a religion or a faith so they are like, no, religion has excluded, church has excluded us. And for example, we have, the have had the opportunity to uh, meet uh, Affirmation, which is a Mormons, LGBTQ Mormons group, uh, uh, evangelical organizations, queer uh, pastors. I don't know, it's, it's, very, it's, it's a very interesting experience. And uh, on, actually in, in, in Latin America, I think Sentido is also known because of this uh, exercise of, 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 of working and talking to religious uh, organizations and faith groups. Um, just to answer your question, I would like to, uh, uh, well, our, our decision is uh, practical. <laughs> it's practical because we do a lot of research and we are like, if we don't translate it into English, our funders are not going to understand what we're doing. So we just, you know, translate it. It's, it's a practical thing. But also, we know that there are a lot of Latinos, for example, in the United States that don't speak Spanish or don't read really Spanish. So we want to address also the Latino community in the United States uh, uh, and just to help people to, to get more information and, and uh, uh, tools to do their work. In the case of Portuguese, we are, we are not translating everything. We are only translating our uh, um, reports. But I think that that's a way of uh, starting conversations with Brazil, which is uh, you know, a, a sister country. And uh, I think that it's, 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 it's very important for us to stop you know, making this difference of Spanish speaking countries and Brazil. Um, and uh, I don't know if, if you can you could share uh, the, 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 the slides or just at least one of the images in the chat that we have uh, um, translated into English and Portuguese, because we work a lot with uh, illustrators and uh, graphic novelists, and we, we translate. So we, we have the money, we do a report, but we take that report and we, uh, you know, like transform it into stories, uh, written stories, like long stories, interviews, but we also transform it into comics and into videos. So we do, we, 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 we you know, take advantage of what we have to make this story visible for, uh, in, in, in a lot of uh, languages, into a podcast, into a comic, I don't know. So if we, um, 
chance to see the, the comics, just at least one slide, or maybe you can share it in the chat. That will be great, so you can have an idea. We we have we made the decision of translating these uh, these images because we saw that in our social media they were very successful. So we said, okay, these these two comics are so this this image that you just shared is a mapping that we do with a data visualization of uh, it is called it says geography of the trans struggles um, uh, in Latin America. So we did an interactive in, uh, uh, data visualization of the rights of trans people in Latin all the region. This, that, this is one example, but we also have other comics of the uh, taken from the reports. Thank you, Julia. Would you like to come in? Yeah, of course. On language of as a global organization, language of course is a total disaster and a nightmare because it's like you know there's a theoretical and then there's the very real um, reality of limited resources. Um, in general, the <laughs> world operates in English and in Spanish. Uh, the general um, so everything that we put out is uh, put out in both English and Spanish. The the, the language of the office is English but everything we put out is English and Spanish. And then we have a global and regional structures, meaning that we have uh, six world regions and some of the world regions uh, work as well bilingual. I mean, of course, Latin America and the Caribbean works in Spanish predominantly, but as well in English. Europe works in English and Russian, for example. Um, the African region works in English and French. Um, but um, language has been, you know, a barrier um, for activism, in particular international activism in the LGBTI field, which is almost insurmountable. And I mean, one other challenge, and, and I think it's it's like almost a, it's, it's like a problem without solution in a certain way, because um, translation, interpretation generically is um, is expensive. And then secondly, all the, man, all the languages that I've mentioned are colonial languages at the end of the day. So um, they replicate, using those languages as well, replicates colonial patterns and po colonial power dynamics. But as on the other hand, it's as well very real that there's almost no other choice for a global organization. I mean, if you want to reach um, a certain you know, constituency um, or a certain sizable constitu constituency, there's like hardly any other choice in using colonial than using colleges which technically does not sit well with our values but there is an absence of a practical other solution um and that's painful it is uh painful um and but yeah as i've said there's like there is there is no feasible or practical solution to that problem and it de facto it does exclude people um and i mean if we look at asia the language diversity in asia is like breathtaking uh, but again i mean Ilga, our Asian region works in English because that's the language where the most people, you know, come can come together and communicate across borders. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my, I think that's my, I think my take on language. Um, and, and of course, modern, more recent um, automatic translation has has made things much easier than before. But still, um, I think language is a key limitation to international work at this point in time because and there maybe we come there i can make one comment when it comes back to to trans persons and um, very often um trans people or other very marginalized communities have are challenged in the access to education hence are as, as well don't have access to learn foreign or other languages uh, which again you know hampers um their uh, their ability to internationally organize and you know i mean it's a it's one component in the further modernization, and of course you've mentioned the question of uh, of class earlier. Um, all of that, of course, is interlinked, as we know, um, and then you know um, comes together in building more and more barriers uh, that you know are more and more difficult to overcome. I I would just like to add something, Bandit, if I can. Uh, yes. For example, with our recent project, we've been struggle with uh, well, struggling now we've been like thinking about you know all, always leaving a budget for hiring sign language interpreters uh when our webinars for example but as you know in this case it, it, you know these interpreters are uh specifically for each country 
So Spanish, Colombian Spanish is not the same as Argentinian Spanish in, in, in uh, uh, language, I, I don't know what to say, sorry, sign language, is that okay? Yeah. So yes. uh, for example, when we want to do a regional event, we can hire an interpreter for uh, international Spanish, but a lot of people don't use international Spanish. So it is also a limitation that we've been working always, for example, with uh, uh, you know adding sub Spanish subtitles to our videos in Spanish, so uh, people with uh, um, you know with limited uh, 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 I don't know how to say that sorry hearing hearing thank you uh, can have access to the videos. So it's just a matter of always you know leaving a small budget to make these small changes so we can start opening more uh, how inclusive inclusiveness is done in our organization. No, thank you. I, I just want to say that I really appreciate um, the honesty and vulnerability with which both of you have said, look, we don't have a clear cut answer, right? And it's going to differ based on context. It's going to differ based on the people we work with. And often it's also a question of resources. Um, in fact, you know, Lee, picking up from what you shared, I remember once we had a sign language interpreter for one of our events and we realized that in India, the deaf community does not get access to sign language training. So they don't know the sign language that we are using for that event. So a lot of these like multi-layered challenges and barriers are very real. And thank you for like just being okay with that ambiguity. <laughs> I want to um, now um, also maybe move into participant questions. Um, there is also a question from panelists for each other. But before that, perhaps we can take some from the audience. Um, these were wonderful insights. And I have to say that from everything you shared, I felt very seen as well. I felt very seen and heard and I learned a lot. So thank you for that. Um, if participants have any questions, I'm going to give you like 30 seconds to drop them in chat. But we already have some older questions to ask as well. I know that some of you have also just shared uh, feelings and challenges that you have. And I want to say that we resonate a lot. Um, I think someone shared that they struggle a lot to get rid of the jargon. And that is very true, right? For each of us that does this work, we get so used to thinking everyone knows this language. Yeah. So I'm giving the chat 10 seconds till questions come in. Picking up from the older questions, um, Julia, I'm going to start with a question from Oscar Lemke for you. Um, Oscar, okay. if you're here and you want to directly ask the question, I'll give it 10 seconds. Okay. Um, um, I can, yeah. Sure. Hi, sorry, it took a while to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I was wondering how do we um, like how do we balance um, using the power of personal storytelling, as you mentioned, Julia, with um, not tokenizing people? I don't know if you have any um, experience or insights for that. Uh, thanks for the question. That's of course the one of the many million dollar questions in the field. Um, and I think well, there's a there's a balance to be struck, of course, between you know your personal narrative and um, not being tokenistic. And I think the question whether a personal story that is used or a person you know being in a certain role and or having a certain position, whether that is tokenistic or not, um, much relates to the environment around the person. So um, as well as the intention to, um, to, and as well to some degree to, um, in regard to the intention that the person is invited to speak or the story is used or the position is held. Um, so it has not, not necessarily much to do with, you know, the person as such, who is, let's say, speaking or um, whose story is used, but what organization has done um, on different occasions. So, for example, let's take Ilga World as an example here, my own organization. Um, so, our board, our board structure um, um, has trans and intersex people across, you know, or let's say our organization has trans and intersex people across all, all levels in the organization, from the board 
um, to the senior management, to the officers. So if we send a trans or an intersex person somewhere to do X, Y, or Z, or to share a personal story, I don't think that is necessarily tokenistic because we have managed over time to walk the talk. I will as well say that this has been hard work in the organization and has not come, you know, generically, but it's been a lot of hard work in order to make, to achieve that. And in that sense, um, then once you have done that work, um, having, let's say, a trans person share their individual story stops being tokenistic. But it's not because it's not tokenistic per se, but it's because all the work that has happened um, in order to get to that point. Um, and I think that's maybe the, the important aspect that I want to share here, that it's not so much um, the incident where, it is, where this has happened, but what has happened in order to make that incident happen, to, to make that incident happen. And yes, if there's an organization who thinks, oh shit, uh, we do have a panel and we do need, I don't know, a woman, a person of color, a trans person in order to, you know, to tick the boxes, that very often becomes tokenistic. And if they haven't done their homework getting to getting to this to, to, to this space. Um, and that is then that becomes problematic because then as well, the person does not have the privilege to be, you know, just a a panel person but is immediately perceived to be speaking on behalf of the group whether um, they represent whether they represent that group or not um, and that then becomes tokenistic but if there is you know if they're embedded in a larger um, framework I think that is the way to go yes I just would like <coughs> to ask what just uh, Julia said thank you Julia for saying that because that I think that is a huge challenge for our organizations so, in, for example, in the case of Sentido, we hired for this for uh, 2022 uh, Alanis to work uh, in, the, in this project, in this trans feminist project. She identifies herself as a trans non binary person. But, uh, and we were like discussing the situation of this panel, for example, why is not Alanis here? Yeah, why why uh, am I talking about, uh, and I am the director of the organization, but I didn't participate directly in this project. Uh, but, and also we were saying like, of course, uh, what happens if we keep hiring uh, trans, um, hiring trans uh, researchers only for trans researches, right? What if we, you know, we, we would like maybe to invite Alanis to participate in another project that doesn't have, uh, then its main fo focus is not trans feminism, but, you know, a wider audience. So this is the way we can start changing narratives of keeping trans people in trans topics, you know, uh, and, 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 and showing people as, as the, their only spe speciality is that topic. I don't think it's bad, but I think we have to help widening, you know, abilities and opportunities for, for mm -hmm. people. And if I can add to that, Lee, I think it's as well very important, as you said, to admit that this is hard to be non-tokenistic. And why is it hard? Because in order to be non in order to be non tokenistic we we are battling structural discriminations that you know have been there for decades and centuries and i mean we are all coming from small organizations and i mean our ability to open those structural um barriers is as well limited and i think sometimes we as well have to cut ourselves some slack in regard to that because we can't if we work you know we work in discriminatory, trans um, and homophobic and misogynist environments. Um, so, and it's, for us, it is a struggle in order to revert that as well internally, because we are battling that whole, you know, structure that has been disprivileged or has been um, discriminated or disprivileged the communities that we serve. And of course, if we want to hire it would be great to hire trans persons, persons of color left and right, but as a matter of fact, it's hard work because the whole system of oppression and discrimination works against that. Um, and therefore, it's as well, um, as, as you have said, Lee, it's, it's, it's as well important for us to acknowledge that this is hard. It's not, and sometimes um, it's as well painful if we don't achieve it. It's, it's yeah, hard and painful at times. Of course, it's well very rewarding if it works, but uh, it, sometimes it's really uh, difficult. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I have to say that that acknowledgement of this is hard, I think also allows more people to give it a shot. 
um, because mm. it doesn't feel like it's easy. You know, everyone can do it. If I can't do it, I'm doing something wrong. And I think that's really powerful to get more people in. And also what both of you shared around, um, I think the key function of moving beyond tokenistic is to check if other work is being done. And if there is more investment beyond that one checkbox or that one event or that one panel. So thank you for those insights. There are a couple of questions that are similar in nature. So I'm going to club them in um, from Cecilia, Agnieszka and a few others. I think the questions are around um, anti-rights movements and the sort of pushback they have done for against feminist movements, right? The backlash that has happened against feminist movements. So I think questions are around what do you think their main goal is? of the anti-rights movements, um, a little bit context into where they come from, perhaps. And if there are any strategies that you think trans feminists are using to resist these anti-rights movements, either of you can come in first. <laughs> Do you want to go firstly? <laughs> I go first, okay. Of course, uh, not a simple question, and I don't think simple answer to that, because um, what the anti what the anti-trans or anti-gender or anti-rights movement want is very is highly contextual and strongly depends on you know the region and the content we are talking about. Um, what is um, I think what is very common to many of those actors is that they are you know more backwards orientated than forward-looking, that they tend to be more conservative sometimes and often very right-wing. Um, and that, and I said, I, I think we've we, we've ex, ex, expanded on that earlier. That um, sometimes these narratives are only used as a tool to achieve something else. I mean, sometimes they are actually used to exclude women, trans women, trans people, um, and LGBTI people. Sometimes they, this is the actual purpose, uh, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes this is just a tool, and I think it's important to acknowledge that both is happening. Um, and I think. Other than that, um, it becomes yeah very very difficult to make you know general comments around what are the anti-gender or anti-trans movements because it's like multifaceted. It's very very multifaceted. I'm I'm afraid, and as well needs a very specific res response in regards to uh, responding to the actual context where this happens. Yeah, uh, uh, I would like to add that. Uh, I, I do agree with Julia when, when you say that, uh, you know, LGBTIQ, trans and women's rights are used to achieve, achieve something else. That, was how, that, that is what happened, for example, in the case of Colombia with the peace agreement. You know, you know people were about to vote, to vote on, the, yeah. on, on if they wanted uh, the peace agreement or not. An anti-right movement used, you know, the gender discussion saying that they accord was full of, uh, you know, gender ideology or something that, that, that thing that they, they say with people, LGBTQ people do, that is basically homosexualizing people uh, or something like that. So they said that the accord, this accord, you know, the document was full of, the, of gender. And they just counted the number of words that the, the times gender appeared in the document. So people were super afraid, saying, "No, now LGBTIQ lobby and feminists and communists are going to, you know, change our mindset and are going to impose, you know, homosexuality and abortion or whatever." And that I, I won't say that that was what what made the 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 the, the voting, you know, to lose. We lose. The, the question was, do you want to to uh, to have peace in Colombia to make this accord with the guerrillas? And the people said no. No, and I think that they used uh, feminism, LGBTIQ rights to influence this vote. No, so also um, in, in in what uh, uh, Julia said, we did a research, a huge research uh, that, that is called manufacturing moral panic, uh, in to understand why uh, anti rights movements are using children's rights, children's rights to uh, uh, move forward on uh, you know limiting human rights no in the case of peru ghana and bulgaria you can find uh, this uh, research online and i think it's a very it's a very uh, uh, interesting 
way to understand how they are moving and using that they don't care about you know like you right they care about you know establishing again the society they they want and that they feel they are losing because this is a matter of losing privileges you know it's the same when we i myself as a white person in colombia are saying that I don't that I don't like the you know like the uh, African American uh, African Colombian people talking all their rights. It's just a matter of me feeling menaced because I'm losing my 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 privilege as a white person. You know, so I think um, uh, uh, it is important that that uh, we 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 keep thinking about you know choosing our fights. We have to learn to choose our fights uh, and not you know trying to talk to everyone. But as Julia mentioned, talking to the movable middle. And that is our parents, our uncles, our aunts, teachers, people who you know don't know about that. And they're like, mm, yes, I don't, I don't want to discriminate, but I think that you know, LGBT could be horrible, but I don't want to discriminate. So this is why we should start shifting our narrative. And also just uh, rapidly, I want to mention that one case in Sentido, and is that we have two characters. That are called Aunt Pyro and Aunt Nora. Um, and we created these characters, it, they are in video. Uh, so they talk up, they talk as as I, I was mentioning, uh, as a movable middle. So they don't understand what trans uh, people are, but they don't want to make them feel bad. So they discuss in the videos, they discuss this, they have this type of discussions. And that has been a very difficult uh and a very interesting uh, uh, learning from us to uh, being activists, but using a non-correct language. That is the language that Auntie Nora and Auntie Hyro will use in their normal discussions. You know, so at the beginning we were like, oh, people are going to, you know, attack us and say that we are not using the correct language. But all, for example, saying he became a woman, for example, you know that we know we shouldn't say that, but our aunt and uncle would, would say this. Type of things right mm -hmm. yeah and i think if i can come in on that i think it's it's crucial because i think it requires us to rethink how we communicate which brings us as well you know back again to what you said earlier about what loretta, loretta ross says about calling someone in i think uh, we as a movement will need to train us as activists in order to actually do that because calling someone in is much more difficult than calling someone out uh, but it works so much better. Um, and it requires us to shift our own language um, in settings that are sometimes very painful. And I think that's as well something that we need to acknowledge that the people who do that, like the, uh, like the trans or people, the women, the LGBTI people who do that, who try to call people in who are transphobic misogynists, they need a support structure because that's actually very, very hard work that, that comes sometimes at a high personal cost. Because... Um, the people who are at the forefront of that, they become targets. And sometimes if if we call people in, they become targets among the actors, the anti-trans actors, as well as the, as in this case, the trans movement actors. Um, because as you said, Lee, sometimes it's it's required in order to call someone in to use language that is not, you know, has not a level of sophistication that um we sometimes wish we we could employ all the time. And but then that's coming back to the jargon uh, to, to the jargon mention, and if we keep using like our most sophisticated all inclusive language, we'll lose um, so and so many people because they won't you know understand what we are talking about in the first place. But yeah, I think my main point is it requires a shift as well in ourselves and how we speak and how we talk. Thank you, um, both Julia and Lee. I think the one point that's really stayed with me is how, and I think it came up earlier too, right? That expanding the rights of those that are oppressed or marginalized only expands the rights of everybody. But I think um, the other points were mentioned around safety, um, someone becoming a target of the movement, things like that are extremely important for us to consider as well. I do want to uplift from chat that there was a question around not just conservative anti-gender movements, but also feminist anti-gender movements and how they could be mapped potentially. Um, in the interest of time, we perhaps don't take that up right now, but it would be really interesting to hear your thoughts in chat. Um, one last question and perhaps closing reflections that we can end with is a question from Pratye. Um, Pratye, do you want to quickly ask it or should I? 
Hi, uh, you can ask it, Vandita. All right, thank you. Um, so the question is, and I think a good note to close the webinar on, is how do we use role models and stories of trans and non-binary folk to educate children and to work with children and educators? So maybe Lee, you want to come in and then Julia or Julia, I see you wanted to say something. So you can no, 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 Lee can come in first. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. <laughs> so um, that's a difficult question. I think that we work mainly with adults who can be multipliers in their, you know, for example, teachers, uh, psychologists. We, we, we I, I think we haven't done uh, any specific material for children, but we think that th we promote, you know, dialogues and discussions uh, with adults that that need to to talk with children. So we do give them advice. We give them tools. Um, actually, when we have these web webinars or uh, trainings with adults, a lot of people ask us that question: How can I talk with my with, with you know my daughter about this? And actually, I think that, you know, young people should tell us how to talk about that because they know more than adults do about gender and sexual diversity than we do because they have had more resources than we do. For example, we didn't have, you know, this uh, TV series, uh, Sex Education, for example. And I think Sex Education has done a great job by, you know, showing us as adults what we are missing in the discussion with, with young people. So um, I think what something that we promote a lot is to listen to young people, you know, to talk more with them and not to feel that we have to always be teaching them how to talk about things because me, we might not know how to talk about it. So in, in, our, in our polls and on our uh, researches and certain, not poll surveys that we have done, with, for example, school climate surveys, young people during the pandemic, we are promoting always that that you know adults talk more with young people, children. Thank you, Lee. Julia. Yeah, the role model question. I think um, it's similar to what Leah, Leah said. I think one that there are role models that are you know available and visible is like very very important in particular for trans people um and they need to be you know visible in all aspects of life you know we need to have role models in um in politics um in the arts in the tv in the cinema etc in order for um well in particular trans kids to have and young trans people or all the trans people who are just in there coming out to have you know role models that they you know um that they can use in order to guide them when they come out um, and to not feel this utter sense of being the only one and alone, which very often is a pattern um, when trans people can come out to this day. Um, we as, as an organization, we don't work with children either because uh, mostly because it's such a deeply contested um, issue. I mean, trans children, I mean, we've done coming back to the human rights frame. I mean, the human rights frame works great when you talk adults. When it comes to children, um, the debate very often becomes very, very irrational, um, which is as well something that the anti, and here we come back to the anti rights actors, that the anti rights actors and anti gender um, actors like use deliberately. I mean, they would use frames as, um, you know, the gender ideology would make your, your children gay or something like that, uh, which, of, which is, of course, like, um, let's say, quite stupid, but it works for certain constituencies. It's, you know, it's simple and it works. It's connectable. Um, but yeah, and that re and I mean, that requires, you know, a counter a counter narrative. But the problem with that counter narrative, again, is that needs to be a little bit more sophisticated as the simple language, you know, the gender ideology makes your children gay. Um, but again, coming back to the role model, I think what is pivotal is that these roles mo role model exist and have visibility like in every um in kind of every aspect of society. And I think that brings me, if I may, to one of the questions around um responsibility of journalists. Um, there is a responsibility as well of journalists to elevate those stories and and as well, um 
make sure that these stories are narrated by the people um, who live them. I mean, for just to give one, one example, when we look at the UK, there is a enormous amount of uh, media articles in the UK that are about trans people, like a tiny, tiny fraction of these articles are actually written by trans people. And that is a problem that is and that becomes a huge problem. So there is a responsibility to elevate um, trans role models and trans stories in the first place. But it's as well a responsibility to have those elevated by trans peoples themselves. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Lee. Um, I know we're about a minute over time. Um, to conclude the webinar, something that I really want to say is I don't think I have felt the power of stories as such an important tool for building bridges or finding community or just making us feel seen as strongly as I did today. Um, as a young queer person who, as Lee mentioned, I didn't grow up with a show like Sex Education, right? And to talk about these issues. And today, personal stories and narratives are the way in which I connect with young people. Um, I connect with my community. So thank you so much, both of you, for sharing this with us today. I'm going to make a small request of people here. No pressure. If you'd like to switch on your video, maybe we can take a photo together and pretend we're all in the same room and not across Zoom screen. Mm -hmm. All the participants as well. It's lovely to see uh, faces to the names I've been reading in chat. Thank you. I'll give it 10 seconds. Okay. And I think we might have to stop the spotlighting then we can see everyone on the screen. Yes. If that's technically possible. Or um, at the corner, you have a view option. If you move from speaker to gallery, you should be able to see everybody. Brilliant, yeah. Okay, lovely. Um, so if you can, you have the reaction button. Pick a reaction that makes you feel the most of like what today was. And I'll give you a countdown before taking a photo. Okay. So three, two, and one. Please keep holding your smiles because we have three screens. So I'm going to be taking different photos. Okay. Time for another round of reactions. Three, two, and one. Lovely. And the last photo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been such a pleasure getting to hear from both Julia and Lee. You're both people I've really looked up to. And a big thank you to all the participants. Um, you all have been so amazing and so engaged. In the chat, you will also find details of upcoming webinars. So I hope to see you all next Tuesday as well. There's also a community reflection wall where you can share your thoughts, you can share a GIF, a meme, anything that makes you feel something about today's event. All right, thank you. That's all from me. Um, for the Heinrich Poll team, is there anything that you would like to add before we close? All right, thank you, everyone. See you next Tuesday. Thank you.